Welcome back, online family. It is your boy, JR, back again with yet another teaching. And today, I'm going to be doing a breakdown of John chapter 15. Uh, we're going to be doing a breakdown today of John chapter 15. Particularly, I'm going to go... Uh, I'm going to go over verses 1 to verses 17, um, and then uh, we will, you know, again, we will break it down in detail, and hopefully this helps somebody who is uh, a member of the body of Christ who may be stagnant right now uh, spiritually. You know, hopefully this teaching can give you a boost to wake up spiritually and begin to uh, throw yourself to your task. So let us read. It says, I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I've given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be, and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my father. I have loved you even as the father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friend. You are my true friend. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my dear friend since I have told you everything the father told me. You didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my commandment. Love each other. <laughs> All right. So there's a lot to tackle here. And reason why we're, we're breaking down John 15 is because a lot of Christians, you know, because of lack of shepherding, you know, I'm going to I'm going to start by saying one of the reasons for this problem that I'm going to talk about. It's a lack of shepherding, you know, for a child to grow up and become useful in society. His parents are going to play a pivotal role in that. Now, if the parents do not, you know nurture this child you know not just physically with food but nurture him with insight and wisdom and knowledge you know and an example to bear an example in front of him of what a man or a woman is supposed to look like or be like and act like and do in the society then that child's chance you know of being able to you know grow up to be uh, of use to society it is going to be very very slim to none because of lack of pastoring you know parents are pastors their children are their sheep and so my point is now what I'm talking about today is there are a lot of children who are you know a lot of people who are part of the body of Christ you know men and women alike but you're not producing fruit you're not allowing God you know to live through you in such a way that he dominates your life style he dominates your words he dominates where you go he dominates what you watch he dominates your everyday life you, we have Christians who they believe going to a local assembly once a week for 30 minutes to an hour and a half they believe that's enough and then from the time they leave on Sunday for the rest of the day and then Monday to Saturday they're stagnant spiritually they're not producing fruits the fruits of the spirit and that's a problem because the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 5 verses 1 uh, to imitate God as his dear children meaning as a child of God we're supposed to act like God on the earth we're supposed to look like God on the earth we're supposed to be his hand his mouthpiece you know his his movement we're supposed to be that on his earth we are his representatives on the earth and in order to be God's representative on the earth his fruit must be evident inwardly and outwardly in the life of the Christian. And so we're going to dive into this because my, my, my prayer for the person watching this today is that after this video, you would understand that, you know, you producing fruit is very vital not only for your own life, because again, if you don't produce fruit, do you have to really question your salvation and ask yourself, am I saved? Because I always say, if you have the fruit, 
that's a proof that you're saved. The fruit to be able to, the, in order for the fruit to be able to be produced within you to come out outwardly, that means there has to be a seed, aka the mm -hmm. Holy Spirit. So Jesus is going to say, I am the true grapevine and my father is a gardener. So right now there's trees where I'm at. And I think it's kind of interesting. Uh, I'm not going to move the camera just because these trees don't actually have any fruits on them. They're broken up down trees where I'm getting loaded at or unloaded at. But Jesus says, I'm the true grapevine and my father is a gardener. He says, look at this, verses two. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. And he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. So we're going to pause. Like I said, it's a teaching. And so I'm going to break these down bit by bit so you can have as much understanding as you need. So he goes on to say he cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. And he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. So to give you a practical example of that in scripture first, I'm going to take you to a parable that Jesus gave in Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13 verses uh, six to nine. You're going to see because uh, this is a parable that explains this exactly what Jesus is going to. He just said uh, his father cuts off every branch of his that doesn't produce fruit. So in Luke chapter 13, starting at verses six, it goes on to say, then Jesus told this story. A man planted a fig tree in his garden and came again and again to see if there was any fruit on it. But he was always disappointed. Finally, he said to the to his gardener, I've waited three years and there hasn't been a single fig. Cut it down. It's just taken up space in the garden. The gardener answered, sir, give it one more chance. Leave it another year and I'll give it special attention and plenty of fertilizer. If we get figs next year, fine. If not, then you can cut it down. Remember, Jesus just said in John 15 that his father is the, is the gardener. And here, this is an illustration of Jesus, his father, and you and I. The gardener in this story is God, the Father. When you talk about the, the 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 man who planted the fig tree, you know, is the Father. Forgive me. He's the in this particular parable that Jesus is given. The man who planted the fig tree would be God, and then in this garden, you know, he he, he planted uh, the fig tree, and as the fig tree was growing, there's no fruit on it. So the gardener in this particular story would represent Jesus because he's the one, the Bible says Jesus is our mediator. He's the one that stands between you and me and God. So when God wants to destroy us because Jesus came on a human body and he understands the temptations we face every day, the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews that he is the mediator that stands in the middle between us and God. And in this particular story or this parable, you see that exact thing. The gardener who represents Jesus in this particular parable, he's the one who stands up for this particular, you know, fig tree. And he says to the to the to the person that that planted it, he when the guy says let's cut it down because it's not it's been here three years and it's not producing anything. The gardener he says, sir, give it one more chance because I said Jesus is the mediator. You know, if it wasn't for Jesus, I'm gonna be honest with you, we would have been de dead a long time ago. Because when you look in the Old Testament, pre Jesus coming in the body, dying for for the for the son of mankind, God had like. You know, he would have patience, but at some point, God would just say, you're done. But when Jesus shows up, there's a level of grace that is now afforded. And and, and you see that even in the story. So Jesus, in, in the story, you see that the gardener, he mediates and he says, give it one more chance. And he says, I'm going to give it special attention. I'm going to give it plenty of fertilizer. A fertilizer. And then if he says, but if we don't get figs next year, fine, cut it down. Because remember, back in John 15, he says, his father cuts every branch that doesn't produce fruit. And he prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they will be they will produce even more. So what does that mean? If you're the person who just attends quote unquote the church on Sundays or the like I like to say it, local assembly, but you don't do anything other than that, like you're not reading your Bible to even know what to do as a Christian, you don't even know your spiritual gift, or if you do know it, you don't utilize it. You you don't produce the fruit of the spirit because you don't you stifle the spirit so you don't spend time with the spirit in order for the spirit to have its way in your life. If that's you, what happens is you know there there I always say that when you become a child of God, if you're a true child, there has to be fruit. There has to be fruit, and if there isn't fruit, you have to ask yourself one of two things, because you're gonna see and I'm gonna talk about this story. There are certain people they come to church, and it's just a habit. It's what they've known since they were young, but they're not actually saved. But they go to church and they believe they're saved. <laughs> this, this, this is, and this could be you watching this. You believe you're saved, 
But being saved is not just because I go to a local assembly every Sunday because I tell people I'm a Christian, I'm saved. That doesn't mean you're saved. Being saved means you read your scripture, you read the Bible, you do what it says. Being saved means you have the Holy Spirit. And if you have the Holy Spirit, you're going to produce fruit. So the fruit is the spirit is the number one way you're saved first and foremost like to be saved you have to have God's spirit in you so if you don't have the holy spirit i don't care if you go to church or local assembly every week you're not saved you're just someone who is a spectator and that's why you have not put hands in the pot to help out in the local assembly that you even go to you just go there spectate but you don't even help because like i said you have to ask yourself if you have the holy spirit why haven't you produced fruit if you've been in the local assembly setting Week in and week out, how come it hasn't begun to have an impact on your life to where you are now actually throwing yourself into, you know, the things of God more? Why? The truth of the matter is a lot of people go to the local assembly, but they're not actually saved. They're not saved. And I don't, I'm not going to tell someone they're not saved. Like, I'm not going to go to an individual and say, hey, you're not saved. No. But I'm saying the reason I say that is because... If the majority of these local, the people who were attending these local assemblies were saved, you would see what I call transformation in the city and in the state. Because when you look at the book of Acts, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, chapter five, you see a spiritual revolution, a spiritual revival. You see the book of Acts, the, the, uh, the first church, what they did, you know, in Jerusalem. It's something to this day. We haven't seen it since. That church was on fire for God and they were unison. You, you know, they were zealous in their zeal for doing the things of God. But we haven't seen a church like that today. We haven't. I blame mainly I do blame the pastors because they've hijacked our church today and they've turned church into, you know, a business. They've turned church into a place where, you know, you become famous. And they. so I, I'm going to blame uh, mainly I will put a lot of the blame on the pastors, but you're still not exempt as someone who goes to church because it's not you shouldn't depend on the pastor to know the Bible. If he's not doing his job and you still have an obligation to read it for yourself, you know, and if you have the right heart posture, God can send the right people around, along your path, you know, you know, to help you, you know, grow further in where you, you might be missing it. But the reality is you have an obligation once you become a Christian to grow. That's an obligation. You have to grow. And if you're not growing, the question means the, the, the thing you have to now ask yourself is, are you saved? Are you saved? For example, if you have a fake baby, and after six years you came to my house and I had a fake baby, you say, JR, something's wrong with that baby. That can't be a real baby, JR. Because five years ago when I came, that baby looked just like that. And then you know what you find out? It's not a real baby. The same thing. You've been going to this local assembly for five years. But when I see you, you look the same. You act the same. There's no change. There's a problem. The problem is like that baby, you're dead. <laughs> you're dead. You're still dead. You're not alive. What allows you to, to be revived and come back to life is when you receive the spirit. And when you receive the spirit, you start breathing. You start producing fruit. People around you start to say something about him is different. Something about her is different. They don't act the same. They don't dress the same. They don't listen to the same music anymore. But if that is not the talk of town around you, if that is not the, the verbiage of people around you who know you, then the, like that baby that, that, that I have, that fake baby, you're faking too. You're someone who's just showing up, but you're still dead. And that's why there's no fruit. But this is the problem. When you're showing up here and you're not revived, you're not actually saved, eventually God gets rid of you. God gets rid of you. Some of the pastors going to preach is going to offend you. You're going to leave. They're not going to live. The, the church is not listening to your ideas. And then you're going to leave. Because you see, what happens is when you're part of the local assembly and you're not saved, what happens is you're fragile very fragile so so and eventually like i said because some churches they have people who've been here and they're not saved but like judas eventually we got to get rid of you not us god's gonna do it just like the gardener who the, the, the man who planted who said we got to get rid of this fig tree it ain't it ain't producing nothing you see one thing about god he ain't in the business of wasting when jesus was doing these miracles you know of the multiplying of the the bread and the fish he was every everything that was left over he told his disciples hey, hey pick that up pick that up because he's not in the business of wasting same thing you 
show up to the local assembly taking up a seat but you don't really care to learn you don't really care to put, put to put into practice what they're talking about when they're preaching what happens eventually is someone else can use that chair and what god does just like in that parable i just i had you read like judas eventually it's your you gotta move out the way bro because you're taking up space and i don't say this ignorantly i don't say this in a mean way but i'm just being very honest it's the same way when you were at a school you ever went to school and a kid gets expelled because it's like you're not here to learn and you're 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 slowing things down brother so, so you gotta go and eventually he gets expelled because he's just causing problems and what i'm saying is when you go to the local assembly and you're not saved you're probably the person that's always causing problems you're probably the person that's always offended for for things that you shouldn't be offended about and the point is it's because you're not saved you don't have the holy spirit within you and that's probably the reason you're not producing fruit and that's why he says he cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. And he prunes the branches that bear fruit. So that, you see, the cutting off of the branches, like I said, the pastor preaches that, you know, you should not be sleeping with your 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 the person you're dating if you're not married. And then you get offended and you leave. You see, because you were never saved. Because you heard some truth and then the truth offended you. You left. The pastor said that being homosexual is a sin. And if you stay that way, you're going to go to hell. You got offended. You left. You see, you're not saved. Because the problem is when you show up, and you get amongst the midst of the true saints of Jesus Christ, the true the true followers of Christ. What's going to happen when you're not really saved? When and if this is a real church of Jesus Christ, they're going to start preaching some truths, and that truth is going to hurt you, and you're going to leave. And that's that's how God cuts you off. God cutting you off is not necessarily Him getting scissors and cutting your neck. I'm not saying He's going to murder you. That's what I'm saying. But the cutting you off is you're not going to be a part of this group anymore because something that's going to be preached that's truth it's going to offend you and because you don't have the spirit you're not going to be willing to submit to what you just heard and you're going to leave and that's what i'm saying to you some of you might be watching this and you don't even go to church anymore because you went and you were offended but no don't be offended the reality is jesus said a lot of things that offended people that were listening to him but the reality is jesus is god and everything jesus said was truth but even when he spoke people got offended go and look at the people that got offended nine times out of ten or ten times out of ten they were the pharisees the people who weren't saved you see, when you hear truth and you're offended, that might be an indicator. I'm not saying all the time. Maybe you're, I'm not going to say all the time that means you're not saying. Sometimes you might have just came to Christ. So I'm going to give, you know, I'm going to get, I have to be fair there. Sometimes you might have just come to Christ. You haven't read your Bible. So you're hearing certain truths and it hurts. It burns. That's normal. But I'm saying when you're not saved, most of the time what happens is when you hear truth after truth after truth, or you see this church is spirit led and they're not looking at the clock and you're like, oh man, they're always taking mad long. Oh man, this pastor's always talking about sin. You see when that, oh, I'm leaving, I'm not going to church no more. They judge me. Oh, they, they because they're telling me I can't be like sleeping around it. Oh, they're telling me, oh, I can't sleep over, I can't go like sleep over my girlfriend's house. This church is mad strict. This church got mad rules. You see, when that's your heart posture and everything the pastor's saying is truth, that's because you're probably not saved. And when you're not saved, you're not willing to, to abide by the truth of Jesus Christ. You're not willing to submit to the teachings of Jesus Christ. And that's why God cuts you off. He cuts you off. Because you're gonna be a you're gonna be like a yeast if he if he leaves you here. You see, when you're not saved, then you get them around the you get in the midst of true uh, people who are saved, like true believers. You, if 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 God allows you to stay there, he in His grace, He'll allow you to stay there with the chance that with the with the hope that you would listen and 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 actually give your life to Christ. But when you sit there and you're not willing to give your life to Christ and you're not willing to change, you become like a yeast. And Jesus told his disciples, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees, because it's like a little yeast is enough to permeate the whole batch of dough. And that's why if you see when Jesus died and rose again, Judas did not get to stay amongst the pack. Judas died. He killed himself. And then he was replaced by Matthias. Reason being is because God cuts off every branch of mine of, of his that doesn't produce fruit. Judas wasn't producing fruit. Judas was, you know, a fraud amongst them. And what happens when that's you, eventually you get cut off. And so that's what I'm saying to you is. God cuts off every branch that doesn't produce fruit. And if you're the person watching this and you have, and, and, and you say, what's the fruit? You know, before I continue, we're going to talk about what the fruit is, because like I said, this is the teaching. So if you're here, I'm, I'm, I hope you're here to learn because I'm not in the business of entertaining you. I'm in the business of teaching you. So I, I, I always say these videos will be as long as they need to be because I'm not looking at the clock. I'm going to teach in full. And if you're here for that, God bless you. If you're not, you know, um, I don't know how to help you. So the fruit, first and foremost, I'm going to read two passages, of, two different pieces of scripture that will help us identify this fruit that Jesus is talking about first and foremost. So Jesus, in, in the book of Galatians chapter 5, starting at verses 22, it says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, 
faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Verse 24 says, those who belong to Christ have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading, keyword in every part of our lives. Let us not be conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. So again, when you have the Spirit of God in you, it produces that type of fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and, and self-control. Jesus goes on to also say, aside from what I just read, in the book of Matthew, you know, chapter 7, and we're going to start at verses uh, 15 to verses 20, Jesus begins to talk about, you know, uh, beware of false prophets. He says, he says who, who come disguised as harmless sheep, but are really vicious wolves. Look what he's going to say in verses 16, I'm counting. He's going to say, you can identify them by their fruit. That is by the way they act. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not, look at this, produce good fruit, once again, he says this, is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. So you see that your actions are what identify, you know, the fruit that you was, it, it identifies the, the spirit that's within you. If you're lying, you're cheating, you're stealing, you're murdering, you're gossiping, and you're slandering, and all these different things, you don't have the Holy Spirit. Because I just read the fruits of the Spirit, and none of those things I just said are, are that, or are in that in, in the Spirit. So Jesus, again, he talks about the Father cuts off every branch of his that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. So let's talk about that. He prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. So the reality is, when you are making a conscious effort, you know, you just got converted you know you're you're under a pastor you're part of a bible study you're reading the bible for yourself you don't depend on other people to read the bible but you get around these different fellowships and these bible studies so that way iron can sharpen iron but the reality is you're, you're growing you're making a conscious effort what happens now is god judges by the heart and he can see your heart your heart posture is you're making effort and because of that, he prunes you. That way you could keep producing more fruit. Because there's a lot of fruit to the Spirit. Even the ones Paul named, that's not all of them. That's not the only ones. Paul's giving you a list. But he, one thing I want you to understand when you read Galatians 5.22, don't put in your mind that's the only fruit of the Spirit. There's more. Anything that is good comes from God. The Bible tells us that in the book of James chapter 1. It tells us everything that is good comes from God. And so the reality is when you think about the Spirit, everything that is good comes from the Holy Spirit. So the reality is everything that has to do with good, it's connected to the Holy Spirit. And so that being said, when you're making an effort, because you're not going to become, you're not going to become this good person. Like when you have the Holy Spirit, you're not going to produce all the fruit of the Spirit in one day. I want to make that clear. Not in one month, not in one year, because you're growing. My, my newborn child is not going to drive, cook and clean and, you know, go get a job the day he was born. Meaning the day you gave your life to Christ, you're born again spiritually. You're not going to have every fruit. But in time, because you're progressing, you know, because you're being nurtured spiritually by the word of God, you're going to grow. And that's how God, he, keeps, he prunes you so you can keep producing more fruit. And that's why over time, if you, if anyone of you watching this, you know, an individual who gave their life to Christ, you'll say that, you know, if they gave their life to Christ, let's say five years ago, seven years ago, 10 years ago, and they've been faithfully walking with Christ, I'm sure you looking from the outside in, and maybe this individual's you. I'm sure you can say, I've seen a tremendous change in this individual, or if you're that individual, like myself, you can say, I've seen a tremendous change in my life, and to God be the glory, because he's the one who prunes you so you can keep producing fruit. And so that's important. So let us continue. Uh, he goes on to say, verses 3, you have already been pruned, because remember, he says, you've been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. So Jesus was talking to his disciples here, the ones who they, they walked with him, so he was teaching them, because how are you pruned? Or let me talk about that as well before I move on. You're pruned by the word. And I want to prove that with some scripture. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you know, God's spirit. Oh, where is this at? Okay. Well, 1 Corinthians 6 talks about the spirit cleansing us. We're cleansed. We're made holy by the spirit. And by calling on the name of Jesus. So that's actually not the one that I wanted. I'll take John. I'll stay in John. John 8. 
where Jesus talks about, you know, uh, following those who listen to his teachings, they will, you know, grow, they will, um, be set free. So, okay, I'll take John 8. I told you you're pruned. What prunes you is the word of God, which is the Bible. So in John 8, 31, it says, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples. So he's echoing the same thing. You are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So when we come to Christ, a lot of us, like myself, we were bound by so many different addictions, whether it was, like I said, weed, you say, you, you say, you know, pornography, masturbation, you know, go a gossiping, you know, slandering others. You talk about cuss words. You know, we, we, we were bound by so many different sins. But as Jesus says here, he says, when you're, he says, you're truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings and you will know the truth. Where's the truth? It's in his teachings and the truth will set you free. So one by one, the more you read the Bible, everything that you have struggled with, everything that you were bound by, bound by the Bible has something to say about it. So when you get on that particular Bible story or that particular Bible verse, that's the opportunity for you to be set free from whatever it is that had you bound. So when you talk about being, you know, drunk, you dealt with being drunk, but you read the verse that talks about being sober minded and Solomon, you know, in the book of Proverbs, he gives examples of why you want to be sober because you, when you're not sober, you know, you open yourself up to demons because you're no longer in control of yourself. When you get that information, now that's, that sets you free because you're like, whoa, I didn't know that. And now that makes sense because whenever I got drunk, I didn't remember anything, but you get that truth and it changes your perspective. And now the truth has set you free from saying, I'm not doing that anymore. Same thing. I remember I used to sleep around with many different women. And then when I begin to read my Bible in Proverbs, you know, chapter five and how Solomon was talking about, be careful for the immoral woman, you know, and then, you know, I connected that with one Corinthians six, where Paul was talking about, you're one with whoever you sleep with. I started to realize, okay, if you allow this immoral, seductive, dressed woman to pull, to lure you in, to sleep with her, what happens is if you connect that with 1 Corinthians 6, if she has a spirit of depression, what happens now, you, you, before you slept with this woman, you weren't depressed, but as soon as you had finished sleeping with that girl, for some reason, you got depressed. Like you just, you, you couldn't, you couldn't understand where this depression came from. Before you slept with that girl, you know, you were not, you know, lazy. Like you had a, a, a work ethic, a zeal. But after you slept with that girl, you just feel so lazy now. You just feel like sleeping all day. And you're like, where is this coming from? Because what happens is if she has a spirit of stagnation, if she has a spirit of laziness, what happens is when you sleep with her, you become one with those spirits. So you see, when I got that information, and now I was like, yeah, I'm going to be a married man and I'm going to stay a married man and sleep with just my wife because I ain't trying to track what she got. A girl that's sleeping around, the truth is she probably has many different spirits in her. That's the truth. She has probably many different spirits in her. And like I said, this is why I tell you when you read the word, it sets you free. So to get back in point, that's how God prunes you. He prunes you with the word, you know, you know, and Jesus has already told these disciples here in verses three, you've already been pruned and purified by the message I've given you. Now, verses four, let's continue. He says, remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. A branch cannot produce fruit. If it is severed from the vine and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me, remain in me and I will remain in you. This is Jesus talking. Who was Jesus? He was the word. John one, the word in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God and the word became flesh. Jesus is the word. So when he says remain in me and I will remain in you, just do his word. One thing you're going to see is... If you stop doing something long enough, you aren't you, you lose that talent, that gift. Not to say the gift can't come back if you if you start honing back in on it. The same way, like someone can fall away from the faith, because we've seen it in scripture, people whose faith was shipwrecked. But I believe with repentance, they can come back and be restored. You know, I do believe in that. You know, so but the reality is if you fall away from doing the thing that kept you sharp, you're not gonna be sharp anymore. So, you know, if you take, uh, uh, you, you put hot water in a, in a, in a, um, you say a pan or a pot, forgive me, you put hot water in a pot in order for the water to stay hot. It has to stay on the pan. I mean, not the pan. It has to stay on the, on the stove. Forgive me. You have to keep that pan on the stove that is hot. If you do that, the water remains hot. But if you remove the water from the, the, the hot, the, the, the water, or if you remove the pan from the stove, It'll stay hot for a little bit, a little bit. But what happens over time, the, the temperature begins to, 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 to decrease. 
Like if it was at 125 degrees, 300 degrees, give it a day or two, three days, four days before you know it, it's room temperature. And that's what happens to a lot of Christians because they don't do what Jesus just said here. He says, remain in me and I will remain in you. Meaning when you read the word, I grew up on this song. Maybe you heard it. Maybe you didn't read your Bible. Pray every day. Pray every day. Pray every day. Read your Bible. Pray every day and you will grow up so the reality is the more you read the bible the more you grow the more you grow the more you produce more fruits of the spirit you know, because you're consuming this we don't give because we felt like giving you give because you read about it you studied jesus that's why you give you don't forgive because you want to forgive if i didn't read about forgiveness in the bible man there's still people i wouldn't forgive and i'm just being real which i ain't gonna be fake about that but the reality is when i read about it because one thing i want you to understand just obedience doesn't have to feel good there's things I do because I'm obeying God, but I don't mean to feel good. This person wronged the heck out of me. I don't want to forgive them, but because God said I'm going to do it. And that's the thing about obedience. You don't have to feel good doing it, but just do it. You know what I mean? Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh, but just go. You don't have to like these people to give them the message, but you better give them the message of God said. And what I'm saying, God's word teaches to forgive. And because I love God and I love his word, I'm going to apply it. And so when Jesus says remain in me and I, and I will remain in you, the reality is, is when you apply God's word, you read his word, you consume his word, you stay in, in, in relationship with the word who is Jesus. What happens is he remains in you. John, James chapter 4 verses 8 says, come close to God and he'll come close to you. Meaning when you get close to the word, the word gets close to you. Before you know it, you could recite the Bible and you don't even have the Bible in front of you. Because you cons you're constantly consuming the word. And that's a, that's a thing because Jesus says, a branch can't produce fruit if it's severed from the vine. And you can't be fruitful unless you remain in me. For some of you watching this, if you're honest with yourself, when you were younger, you used to read your Bible and pray. And you could recite John 3.16 from the top of your head. You were able to recite John 1, Psalm 1. You were able to you know memorize this. But then what happened is you got older. You know, you stopped going to church. You went to college. You know, you got around the wrong crowd. And then what happened? You lost all of that. You forgot all the Bible verses. You don't even have a Bible today. You don't even know where that Bible is anymore. You stop going to church. And then what happens? You forgot it all. And then before you know it, not only did you forget it, you stopped living it. Before you gave to the poor. Before you didn't cuss. Before you were, you know, to God be the glory. But then when you stopped reading the Bible, you got around the wrong crowd. What happened is you lost all of that. And this is why Jesus says, a, br a branch can't produce fruit if it's severed from the vine. And you can't be fruitful unless you remain in me. And this is why for those of you watching, whether it's you yourself or someone you know that used to be with a Bible in their hand and you remember this person was so zealous, like, yo, they knew the Bible like, like no one I know, man, and it was on fire for God. Because you see, at that time, they were in Christ. They were in the word. But when they stop, you see that same person some years later, you're like, yo, I don't know what happened to dude, bro. Like, dude, he was on Facebook bugging. He's on the gram with guns in his hand. He's a rapper now. He's cussing. Like, I'm shocked. Why? Because he didn't remain in Christ. One thing you have to remember, Jesus says this, those who endure to the end will be saved. See, endurance, that's something that when you become a Christian, you have to understand the journey's long, man. And this is why some people, they remain in God. But then Jesus says in Mark chapter 9, verses 49, he says, everyone will be tested by fire. That's what he says in his word. Mark chapter 9, verses 49, Jesus says, everyone will be tested by fire. And so what happens is when some people come to Christ, they, they start reading the Bible, everything's going good, and it's like, all right, cool, bet, this is lit. But then what happens sometimes, and this is this is something I'm saying, it's kind of off the topic, but it's something that's kind of in connection because it could help somebody, is they read the Bible in the beginning, everything's going dandy and good, but then what happens eventually is what I just quoted here, and like I said, March of the 9, verses 49, where Jesus says, for everyone will be tested with fire. The minute that they start getting tested with fire, they don't remain in Christ anymore. Because the fire is like, yo, what's going on? And and Peter echoed this as well, because it is a, in one of Peter's letters, you know, the believers, you know, and I want to talk about that as well, because like, I like to just flow, you know, in, in 1 Peter chapter 4, starting at verses 12, Peter's writing his letter, you know, I believe it was to the people, it was in the people, to the people in the provinces of uh, Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. He was writing this letter to them, and he said to them in 1 Peter chapter 4, starting at verse 12, he says, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the, look at that, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad, for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering. 
so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it's revealed to all the world. So one thing that Romans chapter eight talks about, it talks about how, you know, when you became a child of God, because of you gave your life to Christ, you inherit everything that Jesus Christ inherited. But it, to inherit the glory also means you have to inherit the, the suffering because at Romans eight, chapter uh, Romans chapter eight, starting at verse 17, it says, and since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But look at this. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. So now to make all this make sense to come back to John 15 about the remain in me part, what happens sometimes is we come to God, we're zealous, we're doing good, and we're remaining in Christ, we're reading our Bible, we're praying every day, everything's going good, but then the minute Mark 9, 49 comes into effect, where now you're in a season of testing, because you have to understand, you know, God, the Bible says, will never give you a temptation too much for you to handle, you know, meaning if God sees that you only know minimal amount of things, as a new congregant, a new you know follower of the way, your temptation might not be as great. But when you're someone who's seasoned like a Job, what happens is there comes a season where things kind of, you know, they go left on you. But you have to remember, God has prepared you for that. Because it's like when you have the final exams. You know, for those of you who are in high school or in college, like you are prepared for that if you were doing what you're supposed to be doing. And what happens is you start reading your Bible. So you're getting all this new information. And the devil, he gets to, he get, he's like, well, now that you know this stuff, Yo, God, let me go tempt him because that's what the devil did with Job. Yo, since he's your guy and since he's such integrity the way you say, all right, let's see. And you think the devil, like I said, he's he's like a, you can't, he just, he doesn't have anything new. He did the same thing to Job, but at that point, Job was seasoned. And what happens with you and me when we're reading the Bible, we're consuming these things, eventually what happens, the devil's like, yo, like, yo, let me see what's good with this dude. Since he's reading about all this stuff, he's reading the Bible, let's check him out. And And then you have an obligation, and I'm trying to encourage someone to remain in God. In good times and in bad times, remain in him. That's what Jesus says, remain in me. Because if you don't remain in him, you can't produce fruit. So if a bad season shows up, which really isn't a bad season because God works all things together for the good of those who are called according to his purpose, the reality is your perspective is just not seeing it the way God sees it yet because his ways are higher than your ways, his thoughts are higher than your thoughts. But the reality is in the good times and in the times that don't seem good, which are good, remain in him. Because if you're watching this and you don't remain in him, what happens is you can't produce fruit. You can't produce fruit. So we're building here. Jesus says he's the grapevine, the true grapevine, his father's gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. So we talked about that already, how the people that get cut off are those like that. They're Judas's. They're the Simon, the sorcerers in Acts chapter 8. The guys, are the people who are here, but they're not here to change. They're not here to grow. They're not here to apply anything that's being said. And they're offended whenever truth is being taught. You know, those are people that are going to be cut off eventually at the proper time, the appointed time. If they don't, you know, of course, repent and give their life to Christ truthfully. Because like I said, don't think as you go to a local assembly every Sunday, you're saved. No, you're saved if you have the Holy Spirit. And if you have the Holy Spirit, you're going to produce fruit. Now, if that's that portion, as we talked about, about already, he prunes the branches that do bear fruit. So like I said, you've just given your life to Christ, you're making progress. You know what I mean? You're reading your Bible, you're praying every day, you're fasting, you're, you're, you're in fellowships, ironing, sharpen, iron sharpens iron, getting around fellowship. So the reality is, you know, you're doing that good stuff. And so now... Come on, man. Okay, so you're doing all that good stuff. And so what happens now, God prunes you. How does he prune you? Like we talked about, you know, the word of God prunes us. It helps us grow. We get new gems, new truths, you know. God allows us to learn more and more as we go, you know, and he prunes us that way. And so, you know, that's for the people that are making a conscious effort to get in their word and pray and do the things that are in this. You know, God prunes them, you know, and then that way they can bear more fruit. Verse 3, we talked about how the disciples of Jesus were already, he tells them they were already pruned and purified by the message he had given them. And then we got just of verse 4 where he told them remain in me and I'll remain in you because like I said James 4 verse 8 talks about how come close to God and he'll come close to you so the reality is if you don't come close to God he's not going to come close to you but if you come close to God he comes close to you and even further if you remain in God he remains in you he goes on to say for a branch cannot produce fruit if it's severed from the vine and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me that's important information that he's given because you have to understand the devil wants to pull you away from God he does everything to try to pull you away from God. The things that happen in your life that seem bad, sometimes it's not always the devil, don't get me wrong. Sometimes God is certain, doing certain things that you just can't understand. But sometimes when it is the devil, he's doing these things with the with the hopes of getting you to curse God like Job. Like like he he tried to get Job to do, which Job did it. Forgive me. And so, you know, that's the part we just talked about. So remain in God and he will remain in you. Let's continue. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches, says Jesus. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered and so proud to be burned. 
So now notice what he just said in verse 6. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. See what I had talked about when I talked about putting the hot pan on the stove? I told you when you move it, it's going to be hot for a little bit still. It's not like if, if you take a pan that was on the stove for the last, you say, 15, 20 minutes and it's super hot right now. As soon as you take it off, it's not going to come cold, become cold right away. It becomes cold over time. The same thing with the branch. When you cut the branch off from the, from the vine, you know, from the tree, it doesn't wither right away. But it eventually withers because now that it's not connected, it's not receiving the nutrients that it needs to stay sustained. And this is what I talked about. Some people, you know them, you know, or this is maybe you watching this video. It's you. Some people, what has happened is, you know, they they did not remain in Christ for whatever reason. A lot of times it's because, like I said, they go through that season where they think God switched up on them. But let me tell you something. God does not switch up on anybody. God doesn't switch up on anybody. But their perspective of scripture starts to change because, whoa, what's happening and then they don't remain. And then what happens is they eventually wither. But Jesus says when you wither, he says those are the type of branches that are going to be piled up and they're going to be burned. He goes on to say, you see what I mean? They don't want the season to go, they don't, they don't want the season to go through. But in the name of Jesus, it's going to go through. Verse 7 says, but if you remain in me, look at this, and my words remain in you, as I was trying to tell you before, the words, which is the scriptures. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. So now we got to touch on that because that's very important. Some people be like, yo, God don't be answered. None of my prayers. The question is, are you remaining in him? Is Are you applying his word? Because the problem is you can't ask God for favors and then you don't do what God says. No, they're not. No, they're not done. Okay, yeah, you can't not do what God says. But then you ask God for favors. Think about this for the ones, for the people watching this who might be parents. If you have children who don't clean their room as you told them, they don't, you know, get their homework done and they're getting bad grades, they're disrespectful to you and others. And then they're like, hey, mom, can I get a hundred bucks to go buy the new Jordans? Probably not giving them that hundred dollars to get the new Jordans. Hey, mom, could you get me that new NBA 2K23? Probably not getting them NBA 2K23. Why? Because they're in disobedience. They have not been living or w walking in obedience to what you've asked them to do. And so what happens now, you don't bless someone who's walking in disobedience. If you go and look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28, God, he gives a series of blessings that would follow the Israelites if they would walk in obedience to his commands. But at the same time, he gives them a bunch of curses that will follow them if they don't walk in obedience to his commands. So my point is blessings are for people who walk in obedience. Getting your your prayer your prayers answered is a blessing. And that's a blessing that's rewarded to people who walk in obedience. So, so I'm trying to help someone, no, not me, the Holy Spirit's trying to help someone here. You're trying to wonder, you're trying you're wondering why doesn't God answer none of my prayers or or why like I haven't heard back from God. It's been a minute. He's like, man, he got me on a hold for a grip right now. The question is, are you walking in obedience to God's word? Is there anyone that you're holding on your heart? Oh, you see, I'm not gonna forgive. Well, until you forgive, don't expect to hear from God. You know, until you do what God says, you drive by poor people every day, you don't give. Don't expect to hear from God. The reality is. Some of you, the best way, the, the only way you get to hear from God, I'll be honest, for some of you, by, the God, by God's grace, is when you go to church and hope, by the grace of God, the preacher who's full of the, the spirit, full of the anointing, God speaks to him. And maybe that's the only way you get to hear from God. And a lot of times when he's preaching, the, what God is saying through him is the thing you don't want to hear, which is what I'm saying now. Get in the word and do what it says. Because the reality is, Jesus says in verse 7, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. That's a blessing. When what you have is when what you ask for is granted, that's a blessing. And that comes for people who do what Jesus says. And so if you don't do what Jesus says, but you're trying to cast out devils and you're trying to want, want you're trying to figure out why when I pray the devil's not the demon's not coming out. A lot of times it's because just because you have the right heart posture to want to cast out devils, that don't mean nothing. If you're not living according to God's word, you don't get God's power to cast out devils. You don't get God's insight to be able to interpret scripture properly. No. Do what the word says. And then watch when you start praying. Your prayers will have more power. That's why James chapter 5, verses 16 and 17, which is talking about Elijah who prayed, it echoes, it says the prayer, the earnest prayers, look at this, of a 
righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. So sometimes we, we like to read certain verses, but we, we don't like to read all of it, or we don't like to read the parts that came before that give more understanding and detail of how that verse is going to be uh, fulfilled. The reality is you can't just pray and expect wonderful results. No, you have to live righteously. How do you live righteously if you don't apply God's word? God's word being applied in your life is how you are going to be living righteously. That's how your, your deeds will be righteous deeds. So you have to apply, you know, God's words, remain, allow them to remain in you. Let's continue verses eight. When you produce much fruit, you are true. My true disciples, this brings glory to my father. And that's the thing. So when you're doing the right thing, you're producing the fruit of the spirit. You're allowing the spirit to have his full way with you. You know, you're not stifling him. What happens now when you produce fruit, this brings glory to God. And that's why I talked about in the last video when I said, you know, the, the true way to worship God is with your life. You allow the Holy Spirit to have his way. You allow him to lead your every move. And when you do that, that brings glory to God. That brings glory to God. And that's what Ephesians 5 talked about when it says in verses 1, imitate God as his dear, ch as his dear children. Because it's the same thing. When you have a son or a daughter who goes on to be great, they go on to be LeBron James. Gloria James, who's LeBron James' mother. LeBron's bring, he had, by what LeBron has been able to do, that has brought a lot of glory to Gloria James. When you talk about Steph Curry and Seth Curry's dad, you know, Adele Curry, there, his sons becoming great and being of use in the society, that brings much glory to him. Because when they see Del Corey, they say, man, you've done a great job. Your boys are outstanding. And man, we're so proud of what they've become. That brings glory to their dad. And so now I'm giving you practical examples so you understand that when you amount to what God has called you to amount to, that brings glory to God. The demons have to admit, man, like Satan, whether we don't see it in scripture or not, Satan at the end of the at the end of his testing of Job, he had to walk away with his head shamed because he's like, dang, I did all of that and this guy didn't curse God. Dang, like he really is like a true child of God. And that brings glory to God. So when you and me are producing, we're giving to the poor, you know, we're casting out devils, we're helping people with their understanding of scripture so they too can have growing understanding. You know, we're we're preaching the gospel so people can be saved. You know what I mean? We're 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 doing the things that Jesus did. When we do that, what that does is it brings glory to God based on what the scripture is saying. And, and God, he wants his glory. He wants his praise. And so he made you for that reason. Your life is supposed to bring glory to God. But a lot of us, our lives are not bringing glory to God. It's bringing glory to the devil. And we need to tighten up on that. So that's what he's saying here. You know, when you produce much fruit, you are truly my disciples. So if you're not producing fruit, you're not a disciple. You're not a true disciple of Jesus. And that's why I, I, I always emphasize, I say, don't just think because you go to a local assembly that means I'm a true disciple. No, true disciples are those who obey the commands of Jesus. Those, true disciples are those who obey their convictions. Those are true disciples. We're going to continue. He, he says in verses 9, I have loved you even as a father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. Just as I obey my father's commandments and remain in his love. So again, I tell you, you know, when you're doing what Jesus tells you, not just through his word, but through the convictions. Because one thing I want you to, I want to remember, Jesus talked about the Holy Spirit in John 16. And he, told his, he told his disciples in verses 12 of John 16, there is so much more I want to tell you, but you can't bear it now. He says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. Look at what he says. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me. So the, the, your convictions, a lot of times, that's the spirit that is telling you what Jesus is telling the spirit to relate to you. And he says, all that belongs to the father's mind. And this is why I said, the spirit will tell you whatever he receives from me. And remember what God said in the book of Hebrew. I'm going to read this. He talked about how the laws would be written on our hearts. This would be in the, in the new Testament, because in the old Testament, the laws of God were written on the two stone tablets. But I want you to see something that is very, very interesting. In Hebrews chapter 10, starting at verse 16, it says, this is the new covenant I will make with my people on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. You know, and so you have to think about what that means. And the old covenant, you know, God wrote the laws on the, uh, the the commandments on the the two stone tablets. But in the New Testament, He has written His laws on our minds and on our hearts. Meaning, when it comes down to doing what is right, the Holy Spirit convicts us to do the right thing. And what that means now is you are obligated not only to obey Jesus's commands that are in the Scriptures and the things that are in here, but you're obligated to, to obey your your convictions because when you have the Holy Spirit, it convicts you to do the right thing. 
And you have to obey that because look at, watch this. I'm giving you a lot of scripture. So that way, when you're listening to these teachings, you have no excuse anymore. The Bible says in Romans chapter 14, starting at verses 23. But if you have doubts about whether or not you should eat something, you are sinning. If you go ahead and do it for you are not following your convictions. If you do anything you believe is not right. You are sinning. So you see the commands of God. I told you yesterday in the video I did. The commands is when God says something. And God can speak audibly like I'm speaking now. And he can speak inwardly. Because you are made of flesh. You, are, you have a, a body. You have a soul. And you have a spirit. Outwardly I'm speaking to you. But inwardly you can hear voices. Like right now if you close your mind. When you think about eating pizza. You're having a conversation in your mind. Meaning God can speak to you inward you in your heart. And so you have to obey not just the commands. That's what, So I'm giving you so much meat here. Because in verses 10. He says when you obey my commandments. You remain in my love just as I obey my father's commandments and remain in his love. And his commandments are the ones that are in the Bible, but also your convictions, the ones that are on your heart. When God is telling you, leave that boy, sister, leave that boy. When the, the Holy Spirit convicts you, he's command, that's a command. When he's telling, when he's saying, because God, God is spirit, John 4, 24. So when the spirit is telling you, leave that girl, leave that girl, obey my commands, he says, because he says, when you remain, he says, when you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my father's commandments. And remember, those are the true disciples, the ones who do what he says. So, like I said, obeying his commandments are not just the ones that are in the Bible, but it's what he convicts you. Because I always preach personal conviction as well. You might say, I want to get a tattoo. And then you get a dream or you, you in your spirit, you have a conviction not to do it. That's God saying no and obey his commands. So it's not just, well, I'm, the Bible didn't say this, but what did your conviction tell you? Because you have the Holy Spirit. And if you have the Holy Spirit... Something that might not be written in the Bible, he can speak it to you in your, in your spirit. So obey his commands, because when you do that, that's how you remain in his love. He says, I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. And so when you are, you know, when, when Jesus, Jesus told his disciples, I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. So when you're applying the things that Jesus's word tells you to do, you're going to have joy. You're going to have, you're going to experience his joy because he said, he says, when you obey my commandments and remain in my love, just as I obey my father's commands and remain in his love. Um, then he, 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 I think I read that too fast. So it didn't, it didn't sound right. He says, when you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my father's commandments and remain in his love. So what I'm, what he's talking about now, excuse me, when he talks about, you know, there's joy being filled with joy, that's in alignment with you doing what he says. This is why, for example, can you imagine, you know, the joy that Lot felt when the angels were telling him to leave, but then he didn't leave, but then they seized him by the hand and they let him out. He says, oh my goodness, you've shown me like so much mercy by getting me out of this place. You see, when you obey God, there's joy because eventually God allows you to see that. You see, I was telling you to do that for your own good. You left that girl and then you found out that, you know, she was actually, you know, a devil worshiper. And you're like, oh man, I dodged the bullet. Yeah, because you obeyed God's word. You obeyed his command. And when you obey God's command, that's why you will always have joy because God, you know, his commands are not burdensome. The things he's telling you to do are for your own good. It's like a child today. You know, you obeyed your parents, you, even though it's boring. All they want me to do is my homework and study. But then you look today and you look at you amongst your parents and you're the head, not the tail. You look at you today. You're a leader, not a follower. You look at you today. You're so intellectually sound and your parents are not. And you say, wow, now there's joy because I obeyed my parents. And that's what Jesus is talking about. You know, he says, I've said, the, I've told you these things so that you'll be filled with my joy. Meaning when you do all these things he just talked about, you're going to be filled with his joy some of you are not filled with joy and you're filled with so much sorrows why because you're not doing the things jesus says in his in the bible and you're not obeying your convictions so you're in disobedience 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 and what happens because you're in disobedience you don't experience jesus's joy i always say this peace and joy was something were two things jesus told his disciples he would leave them with and so one thing i always say because he talks about the joy here and then he talks about the peace in john 14 Starting in 27, I'm leaving you with, the, with John 14, verses 27. He says, I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. So I always say when you don't experience, when you, if you're a Christian blood washed believer, full of the Holy Spirit, and you know that, and you're not experiencing God's joy in the season or God's peace, that's a sign you're in disobedience to whether something God told you to do or your conviction, whatever, or God's word. But you're in disobedience somehow, some way. Because I always say this, when you do what God says, you walk in accordance, you walk in alignment with God's will. Somehow, some way, even in the midst of trials and tribulations, somehow, some way, you're still going to experience joy and peace. I believe that. I believe that because those are gifts that God has given us. And so he goes on to say, um, this is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. That's important. 
He says, love each other. But he says, in the same way I have loved you. Meaning your love has to look like Jesus' love. You got to give to the poor. You have to stand up for what's right. You have to forgive your enemies. You know, Jesus is saying, you, he told his disciples, which is, a, which is a word for us as well. He says, love each other in the same way I have loved you. You have certain people that are black and they don't like white people. You're racist. But so, so what happens if, I'm, if you're black and then the white brother is a Christian? He's a follower of Christ. But you're still racist. See, the problem with that, that's not the love of Jesus. Because Jesus loves all colors. White, black, Spanish, you know, you name it. If they are followers of Jesus, he loves them. And they are his children. They're, they're his brothers and sisters. And they're children of God. And, and when you don't love them, you're not loving the way Jesus loved. His love doesn't discriminate. So you ought to love. He goes on to say, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friend. You And so when he talks about laying down your life for one's friend, what does that mean? It's like what I talked about again yesterday and I kind of echoed it today in terms of worshiping God with your life. When you submit your, your life to God, he's able to use you to be a vessel he can flow through to help others see the light. This is why Jesus said in Matthew 5, you are the light of the world. This is why Jesus came to earth in a human body to help us. And so when you give your life to Christ and you allow your life to become, you know, a tool he can use to reach others, that is you laying your life down for your friend. Because well, rather than me doing what I feel like doing, getting lit and smashing mad girls and being lit with the boys on Fridays at the clubs, throwing bottles and throwing money at the strippers, rather than doing that, I'm going to surrender my life to God and I'm going to do what God wants. That's you laying your life down for a friend because... Because like I said, laying your life down literally means not my will, but your will be done in me, through me. And that's what it looks like to lay your life down for a friend. And the reality is we have a lot of people who are quote unquote Christians, but you're not really a Christian because you don't do that. You live and everything has to be about you. We live in a me generation. It's about me, 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 me. You go on your Facebook, it's pictures of just you. You go on your Instagram, it's pictures of just you. You go on your TikTok, it's about you. Everything's about you. You, 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 you. Everything's about you. It's never about the other person. It's never about the people at the church. It's never about your spouse. It's never about the church. And it has to be about you. I don't want that. I don't want that. Everything is I, 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 or me, 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 me. We live in a me, I generation. And that's not what the love of Jesus. You know, the love of Jesus takes the, the mirror off of you and puts it on someone else. That's the mirror of Jesus. And that's what it means to lay down your life for a friend. He goes on to say, um, uh, you are my friends if you do what I command. Again, if you want to be a friend of God, you know, you have to do what he says. And that's what I said. I and mean, that's what the word teaches. He says, I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friend since I have told you everything the father told me. You did not. You didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. He says, I chose you. I appointed you, speaking to his apostles at this point, to go and produce lasting fruit so that the father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. Meaning, he says, I, I, I appoint you to go and produce lasting fruit. And uh, he says, that, and that so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. So in order for the Father to give you and me as well, whatever we ask for using the name of Jesus, we have to, you know, do what Jesus says. Obey his command. That's what we have to do, his word, our convictions. We have to obey those things. And if we do that, you know, we're in alignment with him. We're in obedience to him. And now when we ask things, when we ask the father for things in Jesus' name, he'll give it to us. He'll grant it to us, like I told you before. And he says, I appoint you to go and produce lasting fruit. One thing I want to talk about with this, in Matthew 13, you know, Jesus had talked about a farmer who scattered seed and he scattered seeds in different places. And then the people, because I just want to get to this particular point before I close. And Matthew chapter 13, the, the fruit, the seed that had fell along the good soil, it represents those. And this is Matthew 13, starting at verses 23. He says, the seed that fell on good soil represents those who truly hear and understand God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as had been planted. And so what that means, again, is when you... Jesus told his apostle, I, appoint you to, I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit. The reality is, though, like I said, you have to remain in God's word, you know, so that way the fruit, it lasts. I told you again, in order for that pot and the water in that pot to stay hot, it has to remain on the stove. And so our fruit is not supposed to be seasonal fruit. This is why Jesus cursed the fig tree. 
because it, the, 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 even though it wasn't in season, you have to see the significance of that. You know, uh, there's a, there's great significance to why as to why Jesus cursed the fig tree. And, and sometimes, you know, we, we, we read it and we might not understand why, but, and I'm trying to get there really fast. The reason he, he cursed the fig tree because the Bible talked about how it, it, it was not the season for the fig tree to, you know, be producing figs. But the reason he cursed it is goes back to what he just said to his disciples. You're supposed to produce lasting fruit, meaning you have to produce fruit in season and out of season. There's no reason to say, well, well, God, I lost my dad, so I can't produce fruit. Yeah, Jesus lost his cousin John the Baptist, and then people came to him in the same moment, that same season. They're like, yo, can you cast these devils out? Can you heal our sick? And he, he didn't get a chance to grieve. You don't. There's no reason why you you shouldn't be producing fruit. And so the reason, if I can get there, why he curses the fig tree is because the Bible talks about how the fig tree had not produced and it hadn't sprouted any figs and he cursed it. And he said, he may you never produce figs again. And what I'm saying is the fruit he's asked us to bear is not a seasonal fruit. Jesus has not called you to bear fruit, but then when it's winter time, you know, your fruit, you can, you can be, you could be off. No, you need to produce fruit in season and out of season. That's what that's about. He's appointed us to produce fruit in season and out of season he's, he's called us to, to produce lasting fruit and i believe it's actually in the book of mark and i want to read that and then we can conclude with that you know because like i said he cursed the fig tree but there was great reason to why he cursed the fig tree it was because it had not produced any figs and like i said you are supposed to produce fruit in season and out of season and um you know i don't want to take too much time um, because that, okay, I found it. Thank you, Father God. In Mark chapter 11, starting at verses 12, it says the next morning as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. You see, because that's the thing about your fruit. Your fruit is how other people eat. You got to understand this. When you do good, it benefits others. It doesn't always be, think about it. When I give to the poor, that's kindness, right? That's the, remember, kindness is the fruit of the spirit. That fruit, when I have the fruit of kindness, I don't eat. I don't eat from kindness. Others do. You see, you got to understand. That's why I said the Bible is so spiritual and it has to be interpreted through the lens of the spirit or we miss it. We read certain things and we take them as literal and practical, but they're not. They're really spiritual and they need to be interpreted correctly. Jesus, it says right here in Mark chapter 11, verses 12, the next morning as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. He noticed a fig tree in full leaf a little way off. So it's, it's sprout. The leaf is fully sprouted. So he went over to see if he could find any figs. But there were only leaves because it was too early in the season for fruit. Then Jesus said to the tree, may no one ever eat your fruit again. And the disciples heard him say it. And you have to understand why. Because he uh, he called us to, to, to produce lasting fruit, not seasonal fruit. Because like I said, when that poor person standing there and they're hungry, but you don't have, well, I'm off. I'm not in season of kindness right now. I'm off. You see, I I, I produce this, this, the, the, the fruit of kindness between January and October. But right now we're in November. I don't currently have this, the fruit of kindness available. So I'm not going to give you any money to get some food. You see that? So now he doesn't get food today because you, you're off. You're off. You're, you're not in season right No, you're supposed to be in season all year round. Kindness has to be a fruit you possess all year round. You see my point? Love has to be a fruit you possess year round. And Jesus was hungry right now. But this, you know what the fig has to, the fig leaf has to say to him? I'm not in season right now, Jesus. I, I come back when I'm in. Come back when I'm in season. What you mean? That's why I said the fruit you produce is not for you. It's for others to eat from. When you love, that benefits someone else because you love that person. You're gonna give to them because you have the spirit of kindness. You help because you have the spirit of faithfulness. You don't cheat on your wife. You're faithful to her. Babe, I, I'm not gonna have this fruit of, 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 of faithfulness in this season. You know, I, I'm off. I'm going to be off this in this season. I'm going to be off. So I'm going to be cheating a little bit in this season because the, the fruit of faithfulness, it only it's only available in, in from from, uh, let's say, you know, from January to like I, I, I want to say May because, you know, like uh, April showers bring May flowers. You know, you know what I mean? No, uh, but that's my point. You need to have lasting fruit all season round. Faithfulness shouldn't be here in a season. Faithfulness should be here year round. All right. Husbands watching this. Be faithful to your wife year round not seasonal and that's why jesus cursed the fig tree it wasn't about the fig tree it was that for you and me to get an example as to why he cursed the fig tree which was because he was hungry now and it didn't have fruit and he told his disciples in john chapter 15 and we conclude with that he says that 
I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command. Love each other. I hope, you know, like I said, I did a teaching on this, like I said, from verses 1 to verses 17. I hope this was edifying for somebody who may have needed this, you know, and, and the breakdown. And like I said, Jesus, you know, has commanded us as well as his disciples, you know, to, to continue this stuff. We're, you know, we're supposed to continue this thing of the building of the body of Christ, of being his representatives on earth, of present, of, of producing fruit that other people around us who need, you know, to, to eat from that fruit can be able to eat from it, not just in a season, but year round. And I pray that this, this teaching lands in the right areas. And as always, continue to pray that God opens doors for me to be able to do these videos. And may God bless you.